To all those who are watching, welcome. Our session today will be on service provision and sustainability, infrastructure and innovation. And our presenters today are Sean Connolly, who is a senior lecturer in the geography, geography department at the University of Otago in New Zealand. Um, his research focuses on how communities mobilize resources and build capacity to disrupt the status quo and support regional development. Um, unfortunately, Greg Helseth isn't with us today, but he is part of this. He was he is part of this um, webinar, and he is also a professor in the geography program at the University of Northern British Columbia, um, where he is also the Canada Research Chair in Rural and Small Town Studies and a co-director of UNBC's Community Development Institute. Our panelist, Neil Henlon, is a professor in the geography program at the University of Northern British Columbia. His research interest includes rural health, um, rural health services um, delivery, community adaptations to social and economic change, and regional health governance. We also have Sean Markey, who is a professor in the School of Resource and Environmental Management at Simon Fraser University. His research concerns issues on local and regional economic development, community sustainability, and sustainable infrastructure. And lastly, but not least, we have Laura Reiser, who is the research manager of the Rural and Small Town Studies program at the University of Northern British Columbia. Her research interests include innovative services and infrastructure arrangements, labor mobility, and restructuring and rural poverty. So whenever you guys are ready, um, you guys can take the take it away. Great, thank you, Ms. Aline. Uh, welcome, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be with you today. Thank you for taking some time out of your busy schedules to join us. Uh, today, we're going to be sharing some stories and highlights uh, from a, a recent book that was put together on service provision and rural sustainability, with a focus on infrastructure and innovation. Uh, Musaline did a, a wonderful job of introducing you to the panelists here, uh, all of whom are chapter authors and contributors to the volume. So our, our plan is to tell you a little bit, set the context, and tell you a little bit about uh, how we have framed the, the, the concept and, and issue of rural services and infrastructure. We're gonna provide uh, an overview and sort of a deeper dive onto three specific chapters, pursuing alternative infrastructure arrangements, rural health service delivery challenges in New Zealand, and partnering for healthcare sustainability in smaller centers. Um, we'll then sort of um, finish with a, a brief conclusion and then hopefully launch into a, a discussion and, and, and get into some of the questions and uh, some of the topics that you would like to hear more about from our panelists. Just as a way of framing what we're talking about, uh, the goal ultimately when we're talking about rural and small town service provision is really about building sustainable and resilient rural communities. The volume is framed within the perspective of looking at this uh, at, within a context of policy incoherence. And what we mean by that is that we have come to the point where there's a realization that and an awareness that there are problems with how rural services are being delivered, the state of rural services and infrastructure. But we have uncoordinated uh, sort of stopgap measures in place now from a policy perspective at all levels as a way of trying to deal with those issues. And there are two major shifts in thinking and approaches which really highlight and emphasize the importance of rural services and rural infrastructure as we move into and well into the 21st century. The first of which is a, a, a reconsideration of the primacy of economic growth relative to what is now being talked about in rural development circles as the importance of a more integrated approach to rural development. And what that means is, is as we look at rural communities and regions, we shouldn't simply be focused on the state of the economy, but how the economy is interlinked with issues of social, um, uh, social well-being, social infrastructure, cultural well-being, uh, the state of the environment and so on. And we need much more uh, complex ways and policy systems to deal with a much more integrated approach to how we deal with rural and small town development. And 
rural services and infrastructure play a significant role in that. The second is the transition from a sector-based to a place-based development orientation of how we look at developing rural and small town areas. Sector-based simply means that previously we've just sort of looked at um, uh, facilitating economic development in certain sectors, whether it be forestry, agriculture, mining, oil and gas, hydroelectricity, and so on as a way of then sort of taking care of the rest of the development picture for rural and small town regions. And what we're learning now is that a place-based approach is much more fruitful and beneficial to rural communities themselves. And what that means is we're looking at economic development, looking at building more diversified economic development, the natural assets that might exist in specific places, communities and regions that could be a foundation for a more integrated and diversified platform for economic development. And this again elevates the importance of rural services in rural and small town regions. What are we talking about when we mention rural services and infrastructure? Well, this slide provides some pictures of, of some of what we're talking about. Recreation facilities, uh, water systems, health services and health infrastructure. And of course, as Musaline mentioned in the introduction, if some of us are dropping our uh, internet signal, it might mean that the state of the broadband infrastructure in rural and small town regions is certainly not up to, not up to par, and definitely not up to par as we approach a much more integrated uh, knowledge-based economy in the future, which is highly, highly important to rural and small town regions themselves. And the case studies in the book look at a variety of these different sort of service and infrastructure platforms. Another way of framing the importance of rural services and infrastructure, something that can often gain considerable leverage and traction in rural and small town discussions and policy discussions, is to think of a reformulation of community and regional competitiveness. It's a much more complex process now than simply seeking to facilitate industrial development in one particular area. Uh, considerations of human cap capital and human capital development, how we're training and uh, engaging in skills training and education over the lifetime of individuals and workers, processes of social innovation, so how we work together, how we partner with one another, how ideas come to fruition and get scalable within the rural and small town context, the quality of infrastructure matters, and uh, traditional mechanisms like uh, uh, local economic development mechanisms, which have previously sort of been highlighted in importance, like things like tax rates and things like that are still very important. But as we've reached sort of comparable understandings of things like tax rates, it's really a shift in emphasis towards other aspects and other dynamics that exist at the community reg regional level that have become more important. And when we combine competitiveness with an understanding of place-based development, it really asks us to focus on the quality of life for rural residents in terms of attracting and retaining people. If people can live and work anywhere in the modern economy, why would they choose to live in a rural place? Why would they choose to live in your rural place or region? So these questions are of utmost importance as we look at the viability and sustainability of rural communities going forward. And service and infrastructure connections are critical components of that community sustainability and community resilience discussion. Some of the challenges that we face in terms of um, maintaining and updating rural services, well, some of those are the, the, the traditional rural development challenges of distance, density, and human capacity. And what that means is rural places are generally farther away, they're lower density. Both of those things can increase the cost of service delivery. And in terms of questions of human capital, you're dealing with smaller populations and populations that may not have the same level of access to training and education uh, than in, in urban areas. We're coming through and still within a 30 odd year period of, of a neoliberal policy orientation, a much more market oriented approach to thinking about development. And this has allowed, this has created some significant challenges for rural and small, small town communities that require a more integrated approach to development policy actors at all levels working together and it also requires a significant investment orientation so that when we understand we're making investments in one area of rural development that there will be spin-off benefits accruing to other aspects of economic development and when we look at a more narrow market-oriented lens we're missing a lot of that development picture. Uh, following uh, a significant period of investment, particularly in Canada but in other uh, western industrialized countries that are profiled in the book, 
Uh, much of that infrastructure is coming to the end of its life cycle. There's significant infrastructure deficits in all aspects of infrastructure, whether it's transportation, uh, social infrastructure, community centers, water systems, uh, a major deficit that certainly we're dealing with here in Canada and is also very much an international problem. Um, and it, the new economy raises new expectations for residents. Again, that question of why would residents want to live, retain, continue living and want to be attracted to living in your community, that quality of life picture, the, uh, the services and amenities that communities have to offer are of critical importance to maintaining population and, and attracting population going forward. So all of those questions and those challenges were very much the thrust and the impetus behind uh, putting the book together. Uh, we have an awareness of the problem. But we also have a knowledge of what some of the approaches and solutions might be. And the chapters in the book are really about trying to profile a variety of those issues. There are 12 different chapters in the book, so we're only profiling three of the case examples here today in, in, uh, in a way to sort of get on with more of the discussion. But there are three sections in the book from four different um, countries uh, pertaining to chapters relating specifically to government policies, new service arrangements, and new infrastructure. So hopefully that provides a little bit of a background in terms of what we mean by services, framing the importance of services, particularly as we move into um, a 21st century understanding of rural and small town development. And with that, I'll pass it over to Laura Reiser to provide us with our first case example. Perfect, excellent. Thanks, uh, Sean, and thanks to everyone who's been tuning in today. Um, so we know that public policies have been uh, increasingly uh, reducing or centralizing uh, a lot of services while looking for more integrated or shared uh, service and infrastructure arrangements as a part of bottom-up community development. But these policies are demanding change without providing uh, the funding, mentoring, training, or even appropriate level of authority that's really needed to assess and develop some of these more complex initiatives. And so what we want to do today is just draw upon some of the discussions that we've had with local government and nonprofit sector leaders uh, who have pursued co-location or multi-purpose facility projects in order to meet the goals uh, and improve the viability of community stakeholders. So of course, we're going to focus on five key topic areas for uh, the purpose of uh, uh, being a little bit brief. Uh, and these will include funding, governance, site selection and design, human resources, and equipment and technology. So just to get started off with funding, we know that local governments are often required uh, to match senior government infrastructure funds. And of course, some communities are in a pretty good spot. They've got adequate uh, uh, reserves and surpluses and maybe even a strong industrial tax base in place. Uh, but there are other communities that have a more limited tax base. And so therefore, they've really struggled to come up with their one third share of matching funding with provincial and federal infrastructure programs. And of course, those problems become compounded uh, as industry has reduced community donation programs or even reduced or closed their operations in uh, rural regions. Now, some communities have also pursued joint infrastructure initiatives with school districts through the province of British Columbia's neighborhood learning centers uh, in order to save rural schools. Uh, but the crux, though, is that there's no long-term certainty to protect these rural assets from future school closure decisions. And so rural stakeholders are continuing to build their own financial reserves in order to purchase these multi-purpose uh, facilities in the event of future uh, school closure decisions. Um, the crux, though, of course, also is that communities are pursuing funding through short-term provincial and federal funding programs. Um, but they still don't provide the adequate time uh, to mobilize and engage uh, community stakeholders in planning and consultation that's needed uh, for these more complex uh, sort of initiatives. So now in the early stages of development, a lot of the tendering and construction of co-location facilities are managed by a school district uh, or even uh, a local government. Uh, but the final agreements of the ownership and management of these facilities has created a bit of discomfort amongst uh, nonprofit sector leaders who have invested a lot of time in fundraising initiatives for these facilities and have even managed uh, the site construction in some cases, but were excluded from the security of ownership and control of these building assets. Now, the, in the second theme, the governance and operations 
um, uh, certainly of shared infrastructure arrangements have been guided by a series of very complex set of agreements and protocols, uh, ranging from ownership and user agreements, risk and liability agreements, management agreements, conflict resolution protocols, health and safety plans, emergency protocols, maintenance agreements, and even ad hoc committees that were put in place to address very specific topics. And yet we still have these short term funding programs uh, to guide these complex processes uh, that really require considerable time and planning in order to unfold uh, so that um, rural stakeholders can engage in these things properly. Uh, but these nonprofits and these local governments still have small complements of staff. The design and functionality of facilities uh, were addressed through many common features that are shown here in the slide, such as shared staff areas, multi-purpose areas, shared storage, uh, and even shared technology and equipment. Uh, but of course, budget constraints has meant that some co-location uh, initiatives had to compromise in certain design elements. Uh, but at the same time, uh, there were different uh, types of spaces uh, that required modification to meet regulations and support the work of specific community uh, service and health professionals. Um, ground floor access, for example, was needed for uh, service providers that were delivering supports for seniors, parents with strollers, or even people who had mobility challenges. And then there were also a number of small communities that were using these initiatives in order to enhance the energy efficiency of their projects. Uh, through things such as investments in passive solar heating uh, systems for hot water, uh, geothermal heating systems, infrastructure to collect water from rooftops uh, for use in washroom facilities, uh, and of course better insulation. And so all of these things collectively went a long way to make wiser use of limited budget resources. Now, of course, uh, shared infrastructure arrangements have also transformed the human resource strategies of a lot of organizations. So through co-location, there was greater stability and coverage for day-to-day -day operations. Um, for example, shared administrative and uh, financial staff uh, really supported communication and reporting with all levels of government. Uh, it helped to work through grant procurement processes, um, and just to be able to process local government applications for property tax breaks, uh, to submit invoices, as well as to complete income tax returns. And so the savings that were acquired uh, by sharing administrative and financial staff then allowed these nonprofits to expand other programs. Uh, and then after developing uh, processes for secondment, organizations also shared uh, program staff to provide coverage for those who are away and also to develop different or complementary uh, program supports. And then uh, co-location groups also see op uh, opportunities for joint recruitment and training on a whole suite of topics, whether it be first aid, um, cultural or gender sensitivity training, and even things that were related to specific professions. Now, co-location initiatives certainly presented opportunities uh, for uh, sharing equipment, phone and internet service plans, multimedia infrastructure, and supplies. Uh, this, of course, allowed organizations to reduce costs and coordinate the use of shared spaces. Uh, but the extent to which opportunities were taken to share resources certainly varied and were even underutilized in some cases where groups uh, chose to be uh, or to remain more self-contained. And then, of course, as we've already alluded to earlier, despite a number of provincial and federal initiatives, there's still a lot of small communities around rural British Columbia that do not have broadband infrastructure. And so the absence of technology infrastructure has really limited the design and potential of some multipurpose facilities, as shown here in Euclid, uh, which at the time of our interviews a couple of years ago didn't have the fiber optics in place to support infrastructure investments in their multipurpose facilities. Um, although they did um, hardwire the building in anticipation of future broadband investments. Uh, so just to summarize, our research then really worked to explore how rural stakeholders were addressing infrastructure gaps while enhancing the stability of community stakeholders. Uh, certainly changes from shifting and often short-term priorities of governments or even boom and bust uh, conditions associated with our resource-based economies can certainly present challenges to having the resources to respond to the fluctuating needs that are not compatible uh, with collaborative arrangements. 
and short-term funding programs also don't really provide adequate time for communities to mobilize and engage stakeholders in these complex pro uh, projects through important processes of building relationships and then of course planning. And then while co-location and collaborative service delivery requires new uh, shared governance models, traditional funding models continue to be focused on hard infrastructure uh, without necessary uh, resources for planning and supporting the actual operations uh, of these uh, new initiatives. And then despite a number of infrastructure programs across various provincial and federal ministries, uh, we still don't have a central hub for rural stakeholders to learn about these different models and processes that have been used to develop uh, new infrastructure initiatives. And so we still have a limited understanding of ownership and user agreements, uh, design features that can improve the functionality of these multi-purpose spaces, risks and liabilities associated with these complex projects, uh, and then of course the, the protocols that have been used to guide the development operations and maintenance of these facilities. And so uh, to leave you with one last point, uh, really greater political leadership is needed by designating ministries uh, to lead supportive policies that can shape these complex and collaborative projects through shared service or infrastructure assessment teams or managers that will then provide advice and guidance uh, for people who are pursuing these arrangements uh, that are being increasingly called upon uh, through senior government policies. So I will leave that there and then uh, thank you very much for your attention and I will pass things over uh, to, to Sean. Thanks, Laura. Uh, so I'm Sean Connolly and this is work that I did with my colleague Etienne Nell and we're both at um, the School of Geography at the University of Otago. And so the focus of our chapter was on rural health service delivery challenges um, in New Zealand. So what I'm going to do in my brief time here is just provide, paint a picture of what the rural health context is in New Zealand, then I'll talk about how communities are responding to that context, and in particular focus on the community health trust model that has emerged, um, and then sort of take a step back and reflect on what the implications are in terms of uh, uneven development and uneven uh, healthcare in the rural context in New Zealand. Like many places, uh, rural populations in, in New Zealand are declining. Uh, from a demographic perspective, they're getting older. In this map here, the, the red dots show the areas that are growing, and the blue dots are the, the places that are uh, declining in population terms. Um, the red dots, of course, are concentrated around the, the major urban centres. Um, with the exception of places that have high amenity values or tourism uh, potential um, that are also growing. So declining populations, aging, aging populations, and this is all occurring in the context of rising healthcare costs uh, over time as technology or as healthcare becomes more specialized, more reliant on technology, um, and becomes more expensive. Government is, is looking to rationalize services and centralized services. Uh, in those uh, major centers. And so the, the focus of our chapter was looking at how do communities respond? And of course, communities are responding unevenly. Um, certain communities have the capacity to, to take this challenge on and to develop innovative uh, solutions, but others don't. And so it raises the broader question of our, our health, health outcomes uh, being increasingly defined by, by location in, in New Zealand. What we find when we look at some of these more successful communities that are able to provide, continue to provide uh, health services, they're doing it by making the connection between rural health, overall community well-being, and community economic development. And they're seeing those things as inter uh, integrated uh, and linked together uh, in place. Um, in a really general sense, up until the 1960s, healthcare provision was funded and delivered on a on a local basis, uh, it was highly decentralized. And then through the, through the 1960s uh, to the 1990s, um, the state took control, uh, established a uniform set of standards and rolled that out as part of the, the social welfare state. And then that was rolled, rolled back with the neoliberal restructuring uh, in the 1990s, where healthcare across the country switched more to a population-based model, which reinforced uh, greater centralization in, in urban centers. So in the, the area that we're looking at, uh, in the Otago region, 
there were seven, seven hospitals, and those have now declined to, to three. Um, and so it, it's up to community to fill that gap where and, and if they're able, uh, and with increasing responsibility and a burden put on uh, local, local capacity, ability to fundraise, to raise, uh, raise money, uh, provide services, et cetera, et cetera, uh, as the state has, has stepped back. And so as the state stepped back from healthcare provision uh, in more rural communities, um, there was widespread mobilization and protest to, to try and preserve these services. Um, and that protest and mobilization started off with a particular focus on health services. Uh, we wanna maintain those health services for uh, our population in place. But then it, it quickly broadened out to recognize the, the professional jobs that come along with health care service provision and the contribution that those, those people, highly trained, highly educated, um, highly resourced people, make to the community well beyond uh, health care. So they are a, um, a key component of community development. And those, that combination of things was seen as key to attracting new residents to towns or to maintain existing residents in towns so that people could age in place, be born in place, or, or die in place. And so that mobilization relied on uh, really strong social capital linkages, the social infrastructure within place that came from places that had a really strong sense of identity, a real commitment to preserving place and making sure that their, their town or their communities um, uh, continued uh, to exist as they, they saw them into the future. Um, so largely relying on relatively uh, stable or successful rural regional economies that weren't um, as uh, impacted by the, the traditional boom and bust cycle. So these were more stable uh, rural economies uh, where there was a strong sense of solidarity. So that, that protests rapidly shift in, in some of these places <clears throat> to a model of co-provision of, of health services. And so what that model, that the model that emerged uh, was the Community Health Trust model. So it's a community nonprofit organization that uh, is able to provide local leadership and innovation to provide local, uh, local sp localized and specific health services to uh, particular community contexts. They're able to rely on, uh, as an organization, to lobby and because they were able to speak with one voice for the community to lobby and gain external support, drew heavily on local capacity and resources capability that exist in place, uh, primarily relying on those local healthcare professionals that, that exist, um, but also heavily reliant um, in a voluntary and particularly a financial capacity in support of uh, individuals and businesses uh, that exist in small towns and uh, predominantly in the, the more wealthy rural farming districts that surround towns. Um, that, and that has been a continual draw of volunteer resources and financial support. There has been partnerships with the state to uh, receive some subsidies from the state for, for some of these services, and that has been critical to their, their success. Um, and so some of the benefits of the, this kind of model, clearly there's greater uh, level of community control over health services. There's improved access to services in place and, and a sense of community empowerment where these uh, community health trust models have been established and have uh, been successful. The flip side of challenges, there's a large administrative burden, particularly in relation to this uh, obtaining state support and meeting all the requirements, uh, administrative and financial, in, in order to, to maintain that state subsidy. Uh, significant, significant financial impact, and it has polarized uh, communities because the health care provision has um, taken away the ability and the capacity for community to do volunteering and to support other, other types of initiatives that may be equally required. So I'm just gonna briefly talk about the Lawrence example. In the chapter, we talk about uh, Clyde and Tapanui as well. But just to give you a sense of the, the overall geography, uh, we've got the Southern Alps, the mo mountain chain that runs along the Western coast uh, of the South Island. And then there's smaller mountain chains that uh, follow the coast uh, 
around in sort of a U shape. Um, so these these rural communities are dispersed, low levels of population, and they're not um, not the most accessible uh, places all of the time because of the geography. So Lawrence. Lawrence is a uh, town that uh, boom, boomed initially because of the, the gold rush in the 1860s, um, and it has uh, since transformed itself into an agricultural uh, service town. Uh, population peaked at about 800 in the 1970s, and it's down to about 400 uh, today. Uh, but it's supported by a, a larger rural district, uh, so with a combined population of about 1,000 people. And that's largely sheep and beef farming, and so that's relatively stable uh, population. Um, the, that economy has been relatively stable over time um, and is, is doing relatively well. And so the Tuapika Community Health Trust was established when the state decided to close the local hospital, and there's a picture of it there uh, to give you a sense of the, the scale of that hospital. Um, so the, the health trust stepped up to take direct control over the state health state hospital. Um, they ended up buying the facility from the state for a dollar under the condition that they would raise a million dollars uh, in the community to upgrade the, the facilities there. Um, so right now it uh, provides 17 rest home or aged care beds, uh, five district health board subsidized hospital beds, there's a general practitioner, um, community nursing, meals on wheels, and all kinds of community support there. They have recently purchased the, the local pharmacy to provide that full range of healthcare services. And they are the significant employer in the town now with uh, 23 different local jobs, uh, almost uh, $700,000 in salaries a year. But their future is, is uncertain. The number of the, the population isn't quite high enough to support the, practic the general practitioner. And so they're having ongoing conversations about do we expand our facilities if so we need to raise an additional uh, two million dollars to, to provide more aged, aged care beds to cross subsidize uh, some of the other um, services so just to conclude um, this the Lawrence example is one that has been relatively successful although it's not very uncertain into the in the future but these kind of models do demonstrate the ability for communities to come together uh, under particular conditions where there's high levels of capacity and social cohesion uh, to provide uh, rural services for, for their populations. The heavy, heavy reliance on fundraising, volunteerism, the capacity to, to volunteer um, creates a really uneven situation where some places might be successful in, in these kind of initiatives and others will not. Um, clearly, the population-based funding model is doing a disservice to rural service population and um, is driving uh, further centralization of services in the, in the state um, uh, into the urban centers. Um, and that's creating a real challenge uh, in terms of places that are able to provide services on their own at a community level have an increasing burden in terms of administration and management and responsibility. Um, with very little support. Um, and so it raises all kinds of questions about um, the unevenness, unevenness of uh, rural health care provision uh, in New Zealand as part of the larger sort of uneven development uh, spatially across the country. And I'll leave it there and I'll pass it on to Neil. Okay, thank you, Sean. Uh, I'm going to follow along um, in the healthcare vein. And uh, this particular presentation uh, will be looking more at um, aspects of networking and partnering uh, to create more sustainable healthcare systems in smaller urban centers. I just wish to acknowledge as well my co-authors on this chapter, Martha McLeod from the School of Nursing at UNBC, Patricia Ray from the School of Business at University of Alberta, and David Snadden, who's from the Faculty of Medicine at UBC. Uh, in Canada, numerous commissions and task forces have called for a primary health care approach to rural and remote health care delivery and for reforms such as team-based primary care practice, alternative modes of physician remuneration, and more integrated and coordinated health care delivery. Progress towards these ideals, however, has been modest. Many factors have created barriers to primary health care reform, but prominent among these are a lack of clear central policy direction 
and strong resistance from uh, health professionals. Yet one health authority serving a predominantly rural region appears to have made some headway in working towards primary health care reform. What was originally a pilot project to improve chronic disease management has become a collaborative, community-based, multi-sector, and inter interdisciplinary effort to achieve whole systems change. And we are particularly interested in how and why a regional health authority felt it was important to go upstream and engage with municipal leaders as partners in whole systems change. Going upstream in this case details the creation of partnerships between the regional health authority, independent healthcare professionals, mainly physicians, and municipal leaders to pursue healthy community activities and healthcare change management processes. This case study explores the idea that engaging community leaders as agents of population health and primary healthcare transformation offers a way to address some of the persistent barriers to healthcare reform. Uh, the Northern Health Authority, or Northern Health as it prefers to be known, is one of five regional health boards established by the BC government in 2002. It administers a wide variety of health programs, including acute care, mental health and addictions, home and, and continuing care, public health, disease management, and diagnostic services. Uh, Northern Health serves a population of fewer than 300,000 persons spread over half of the provincial land base. The health outcomes of the population in the region are generally among the poorest in the province, and many communities experience persistent problems recruiting and retaining healthcare personnel. So in short, the population and communities served by Northern Health exhibit many of the classic challenges of rural and remote health care delivery. The health reform initiative discussed in this case study was formalized in 2009, but its antecedents were evident um, years earlier. So the case is therefore presented in three subsections, a preliminary and foundational phase from 2002 to 2005, an adaptive strategy phase from 2006 to 2009, and then the experiential phase of partnering uh, with community groups from 2010 to present. The reform initiative began its life as a set of pilot initiatives funded through the federal government's primary health care transition fund, which ran in the early 2000s. Northern Health received its share of funding and quickly drafted a three-year plan that focused exclusively on improving chronic disease management at each pilot site. Northern Health organized workshops in September of 2003 to inform key stakeholders and community collaborators, uh, mainly local physicians and program managers, of these plans. The feedback it received, however, prompted an abrupt change of direction, and that is the community collaborators expressed strong concerns about Northern Health's apparent top-down approach and its exclusive focus on clinic-based disease management efforts and called instead for a greater community-based focus on prevention and health promotion. So following this experience, Northern Health committed to a different approach to primary health care development and drew on integrated professional education, shared care approaches, and public health education. The resulting community collaborative project was designed around a model of interdisciplinary teams that would manage wider areas of primary health care practice rather than chronic diseases exclusively. The newly redesigned pilot initiatives were implemented at seven sites across the region, and these uh, projects uh, came to an end, uh, but their legacy is tied to a very valuable lesson that Northern Health learned about the importance of giving community stakeholders, in this case, family physicians and local managers, the opportunity to provide meaningful input about how to proceed with healthcare transformation. When the pilot project wrapped up in 2006, Northern Health decided to pursue a more long-term comprehensive strategy to guide reform efforts throughout the region. Care North uh, was presented as a partnership between Northern physicians and the health authority guided by the vision of, quote, a healthcare system founded in primary care and community. The need for community consultation and input was reiterated throughout the strategy, but communities were not expressly named as co-partners in the Care North strategy. This reflected a preoccupation at that time for Northern Health to ensure buy-in from physicians in the region. Concerned to keep the momentum of its reform efforts moving, Northern Health adopted the concept of a primary care home, which clearly aligned to the vision of a medical home favored by physicians, and it integrated this into its Care North strategy. By 2009, Northern Health had produced its final draft of a vision and strategy for community-based primary healthcare transformation, centered around the concept of a primary care home. 
It then embarked on region-wide co community consultations to share the draft strat strategy and solicit feedback uh, from community stakeholders. Following this, CARE North was formalized and incorporated into the authority's new five-year strategic plan. So Northern Health intended to carry out this work in three phases. The first was to partner with communities who were willing and prepared for the initiative. So six communities were chosen as change leaders and local physicians, municipal officials, so the mayors and some council members, and program managers uh, working for Northern Health were recruited at each site to serve on local implementation committees. The second stage was to equip these committees with information to identify the health needs and priorities of their respective communities. The third stage, these committees were to identify specific ways to transform local health services, as well as to mobilize resources around particular healthy community activities based on the needs and priorities identified in the previous stage. But the important point here is that the planning and delivery of a healthy community initiative was integrated with the healthcare change management processes rather than being treated as an add-on or separate activity. So in other words, the healthy community activities were to be designed and delivered with the full participation of local physicians and health authority personnel rather than strictly as a quote-unquote community undertaking. This way of engaging upstream with community is arguably the most distinctive feature of this uh, strategy and most clearly expresses Northern Health's commitment to community-based primary healthcare reform. So while the healthcare change management activities have moved slowly, in other words, the, the changing of the actual health programs and so on, the Healthy Communities Initiative has flourished. According to an internal report, healthy community committees were up and running within one year in all six of the uh, change leader communities. Mayors and other communities throughout the region also expressed interest in creating healthy community partnerships, even though their communities were not among the original six reform sites. And by the following year, the number of healthy community partnerships had grown to 11. The engagement of municipal leaders and healthy communities appears to have awakened a greater sense of agency in shaping the future of healthcare in the communities. In one of the six communities chosen as a change leader, municipal officials mobilized to help deal with the sudden departure of a number of physicians in the community. In this instance, municipal leaders worked in conjunction with health authority partners, ministry officials, and local physicians to establish a nonprofit primary care society, negotiate alternative physician funding arrangements, recruit new physicians, and open a new multidisciplinary clinic to serve as a primary care medical home for the community. So just in terms of a discussion then, a series of factors clearly helped sustain the initiative. Northern Health consistently took advantage of opportunities to build and strengthen its partnership with physicians, but it never lost sight of its commitment to community participation. Northern Health also enjoyed an uncommonly lengthy period of stable leadership. So in other words, more than a decade uh, uh, with um, the same basic leadership uh, team, during which time this senior executive team enjoyed the full confidence of its board of governors. While this particular, these particular features are not likely to be present uh, elsewhere, the case does offer compelling support for the notion that healthcare reform requires a great deal of time, persistence, and opportunism. This is not to say that Northern Health's reform approach is without its flaws and blemishes. So Northern Health en encountered a, a good deal of intense uh, internal resistance, from, especially from its unions, which has slowed down a lot of the efforts to realign local health services. As a result, the time commitments of community partners have been greater than first anticipated, and this comes at a cost to all concerned. Shortcomings and setbacks aside, the work of partnering for community-based primary health care reform in Northern British Columbia continues. And there is evidence that its upstream efforts are gaining momentum, which should bode well for the prospects of ongoing health care reform. And if I just get the last slide. So in terms of the lessons that this case might offer, for reform in other jurisdictions. Well, first, it highlights the importance of approaches that respect and reflect the conditions, needs, and preferences of the places affected. Second, we should look beyond physicians and healthcare administrators as the only agents of change. There's clearly a role for communities and community leaders. Third, community-based re reform efforts are not sufficient on their own, and a certain level of central oversight is necessary, be that from a regional body or some higher level of authority. 
In this case, the organizational stability of the health authority provided sufficient, was, or proved sufficient, sorry, to, to build a, uh, at least a modest level of support for primary healthcare reform from the two more senior levels of government. And fourth, this case speaks to the importance of adaptive strategy and collective learning. All partners in the process made accommodations and learned from their experiences. The health authority learned that uh, important lessons about community consultation. Physicians learned to relate differently to communities and the health authority. And finally, municipal leaders appeared to grow more confident in their role as partners in reform. So the case of primary health care reform in Northern BC is by no means a clear success. The strengths that I've highlighted here are more structural than procedural, or sorry, they're more structural and procedural than outcome-based. Um, but the main achievements are that physician groups are engaged, that a space has been created for local community leaders to have a meaningful say in healthcare governance, and some headway has been made in making change in rural healthcare delivery. Moving forward, these efforts will need a balance of central direction and local discretion to ensure that healthcare is realigned and reoriented to best reflect the needs, preferences, and circumstances of the communities they serve. Thanks. Wonderful. Thanks very much, Neil. Just by way of quick con conclusion here, and one of the central arguments in the book is that we really need a much more entrepreneurial approach to local service delivery, which is highly inclusive of local organizations and local governments. By entrepreneurial, we're not, this is not code word or synonymous with government offloading and um, you know, placing the burden for rural service delivery and infrastructure renewal specifically on communities, which may be under resourced to deal with those challenges. And in terms of some you know, closing policy recommendations, we really left with three, three pieces here that we've highlighted, um, come out really nicely in the presentations that we've heard in the webinar today, that solutions need to be place-based and highly context sensitive. There's no one size fit all to rural service delivery and infrastructure renewal, and government policies need ways to accommodate that variability. There are solutions uh, present throughout the book in terms of a more regionally constructed and regionally coordinated approach to service delivery and infrastructure renewal, but that this is highly different from how perhaps regionalism has been pursued over the past 30 years where places become regionalized, they get regionalized. It's something that happens to them in terms of service delivery centralization. And finally, that these solutions and innovative examples are really highly co-constructed with rural communities, local governments, and senior governments. We need a significant amount of investment and an investment orientation to thinking about service renewal and infrastructure renewal, but there will be tremendous cascading benefits that come down from a more integrated approach to approaching rural development. The book is full of a variety of policy recommendations and examples. I've highlighted just a few of those at the bottom of the slide here. We frame these policies within the context of what we're calling pragmatic innovation, which has a highly sort of rural sensibility of pragmatism attached to how we go about um, pursuing some of these examples and innovations. Uh, and sort of these entrepreneurial approach is not simply about uh, trying to deliver the same services but with fewer resources or with less quality or try to patch together ongoing infrastructure, but really how can we look at sort of reframing, restructuring rural service delivery and infrastructure renewal in rural and small town places so that it's more sustainable, viable, cost effective going forward in the future. So with that, we'd like to thank all of you for joining us. We'll turn it over to questions. Uh, tremendous thanks go to the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada for helping with the funding of this research work. Uh, the Rural Secretariat team, which has drawn us together and helped us organize this webinar. Uh, the fabulous people with the production team at Rutledge, which helped us with the volume. And of course, the individuals and organizations that contributed uh, their knowledge and experience and time to all of the chapters that are represented in the books. And a uh, special thanks also to Neil and Sean for joining us from the author group team uh, to present some of their findings today. So with that, I'll pass it over to Mousseline and perhaps she can um, help us work through some of the questions and answers here. Alrighty, thank you, Sean, Neil, Laura, and Sean for sharing this information with us. Um, it was very informative. Um, I will get you to unshare your screen before we start the Q&A session here. Um, so we do have a few questions here already. Um, so my first question was from 
um, Kathleen. She is wondering how uh, neoliberal agendas may have been challenged with some of these superb efforts. I could take a first shot of that. Thanks, Kathleen, for joining us. Uh, I, I think what we're seeing is a, uh, a challenge to that neoliberal orthodoxy of, of, of downloading and uh, offloading responsibilities from senior governments on the communities. Uh, in one sense, uh, there has been a flourishing of community innovation and organization. I think we saw that in, certainly in the cases uh, of New Zealand. Um, but what we're finding is that, that that's not sufficient. Um, we need, we need co-constructed solutions here. Senior governments need to be part of the, the solution and part of the, 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 the challenge of, of reconstructing robust rural services and infrastructure. Uh, and um, it, the, the market-oriented approach has, has really done a disservice right as our knowledge base about rural development has moved much more into this place-based integrated terrain. So I don't know if others have, uh, have comments on that. Well, I'll, I'll just say, I'll just add a little bit there, if, if it's okay. Um, the, 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 the issue of downloading and offloading was a really big one uh, in this case study that I presented uh, in terms of uh, engaging community leaders, municipal leaders, mayors, councillors, and so on. Uh, very wary and suspicious that uh, yet more responsibilities are being downloaded from more senior levels of government. And it uh, took quite an effort on the part of uh, the health authority uh, to build the confidence and trust that um, that, that wasn't the case, that uh, while there were obviously responsibilities and roles that were being foisted upon um, municipal leaders, uh, there were also going to be supports uh, there, and the, there were also opportunities as well to, um, to use this experience um, uh, for the benefit um, uh, of the capacity of, of local communities as well. But that... Um, the, the suspicions were, were, were very much present and uh, all were uh, like a cloud that uh, were, was hanging over the, the, at the beginning of the, of the initiative and it, and it took some effort to, uh, to convince local leaders that it wasn't just another example of neoliberal offloading. All right, thank you. I think, I think the only thing I would add is uh, particularly in New Zealand we're seeing communities have been very reactive in this space and they're really struggling to come to grips with how they can be more proactive in, in addressing these in a more, more positive way, in a more substantial way um, in response to the offloading and that kind of thing. And I think part of that comes with the ability to, to network and, and partner beyond, beyond place. And uh, I think that's still, still a work in progress uh, in New Zealand at least, but uh, I that, that is where I see the, the potential in the future. Alrighty, thank you everyone. Um, we also have another question, it's from Ray Bowman. Um, this one is to Laura. Um, so Laura, you concluded with a call for political leadership to foster slash support the idea of shared services. What specifically might you do if you were premier for a day? Perfect. Uh, thanks, Ray, for the question. Um, I think one of the reasons why I, I tended to focus at the very end on calling for a central hub about these models and processes and also trying to get some uh, shared infrastructure managers or assessment teams in place um, was really critical because what we were finding is we were talking with service co-ops uh, or other um, rural stakeholders engaged in co-location initiatives and they um, struggled to connect with provincial staff who had good knowledge about how to proceed with these kinds of complex initiatives in terms of understanding the risks and liabilities especially, uh, but also some of the complications around uh, ownership and user agreements. Um, and so uh, that would be sort of the, the, the key uh, component because uh, what was happening is a lot of these service co-ops were being asked to guide other groups in other communities uh, and they already had limited staff so we really need to make sure that the we had good provincial staff in place uh, to guide some of these things going moving forward already thank you laura um another question is from kyle um he said his issue is for neil and sean um so 
we continue to ex um, expect rural citizens to do more, act more. So he is concerned about the burden of more volunteering of citizens. How do we deal with this? Um, he's not talking about the rural players that get paid to be involved, but the expectations of the rural citizens to get more and more involved, not looking at that as empowering, but burdening. Any comments? Uh, sure, I think that's that's a real concern. Uh, I think what we can say, at least uh, in the New Zealand cases, is communities have been have been successful at coping with the the offloading of services <clears throat> in some places. I haven't talked about all the places where the hospital closed and now there's nothing, of course, but um, they have been successful with coping. But it's continue a continual and increasing burden of, of coping. There's no with no underlying structural changes to, to the way things operate. And, uh, and communities are getting burnt out. They're getting tired of being asked to fund, uh, to donate uh, funding to support what should be, what people see as sort of services that should come with, uh, as a right. Um, and so that, that's where I think sort of goes back to the, uh, my answer to the, the previous question is there needs to be uh, more, more of a more partnerships and collaboration across places uh, to to try and create a, a broader sense of how might we address the underlying structural issues that are that are causing these problems and trying to to reduce that burden on on individual places. I very much agree with what Sean said. Um, I'd also. Um, point out a point that Laura raised um, uh, about uh, the nature of uh, the kinds of support that you tend to get from, uh, you know, provincial governments and sometimes federal governments and so on, uh, always towards infrastructure, always towards uh, buildings and so on, but never the operation uh, of services and so on. And I think that um, really we have to do better um, to support um, a lot of the the volunteer-based uh, service delivery, um, because there's, there's just always an assumption or a presumption that uh, there's just heaps of social capital and, and uh, just an unending supply of volunteers and, and community-minded folks um, uh, in smaller centers. But uh, I think there's a real danger in that assumption. So. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a question from Bill Reimer. Um, so do you have any examples in which rural communities have looked to urban people and organizations for financial and networking support? For example, what about connecting with past residents who have moved to urban regions or seasonal residents? Uh, we have examples where these people not only have access to financial resources, but also to policymakers who have influence. What type of cases have they made? Um, in the work that we did, there, there wasn't necessarily a lot of that, um, but just to provide one uh, example, um, right now there's a, a lot of um, discussion out there about community foundations, for example. In fact, in the book, we've got a great chapter that was put together by Ryan Gibson out of Guelph that looks at the role of community foundations and philanthropy in supporting these kinds of things. Um, we, we don't have a lot of community foundations in rural British Columbia, um, but uh, certainly, or that are that you know fully matured enough to be able to to start granting funds anyway. Um, but the Prince George Community Foundation started managing community foundations on behalf of smaller rural communities around British Columbia, so that they would get to be able to grow faster. Uh, but still, the challenge is when you get these unincorporated areas, uh, there just isn't uh, necessarily a lot of activity where they can raise the funds fast enough where it matures to a point where they can actually start drawing upon it. Um, so it's still a work in progress, but they, they have been able to get a few of those uh, uh, to that point. I've also seen uh, some good sort of urban rural uh, coordination and networking that's been linked with things like the expansion of social enterprise delivery, uh, which can certainly play a role in rural service delivery, uh, questions and issues of social procurement, uh, so, you know, growing networks at a, at a provincial and across uh, really a national level uh, that are looking at these alternative models and how they're relevant in rural contexts. Okay, thank you. 
Um, Helen has a question. Um, her question is, are the speakers unlikely to support public-private partnership for rural infrastructure? How, real how realistic is this given limited public resources? Um, I am finding the exact opposite in the field of rural um, broadband research, fiber, and wireless infrastructure. Um, maybe I'll just uh, respond uh, quickly, um, just to give an example of some of the challenges that have occurred recently in Kitimat. Uh, you know, I think one of the challenges is people assume that small communities have access to a lot of big industry uh, revenues um, or community donation programs, but industries have increasingly been um, sort of revamping their community donation programs. Uh, so that's certainly one challenge. Um, and a lot of uh, communities have started to um, struggle with getting small businesses uh, being able to engage in, in, in supporting certain things just because they're struggling you know, as well. Um, but in the case of Kitimat, uh, they started working with a lot of work camps because they've had a lot of large scale industry activity uh, recently. And so they started getting um, uh, contributions for work camp beds that were becoming operational. And uh, so $500 would go uh, in, uh, to an affordable housing fund that has now been invested and has been drawn upon um, so that they now have second stage transitional housing and they have some emergency shelter beds and some other low income housing uh, as a result of that. Uh, so that provides a little bit of a, a nugget in terms of what was happening between industry, local government and nonprofits and the provincial government there. I think it also highlights the role that senior governments can play. I mean, uh, public-private partnerships, uh, I think, certainly could be part of the solution. Uh, Wayne, who was uh, uh, unfortunately unable to join us today, who wrote the chapter on broadband, might have, might have more to say on that. Um, but it, it, it speaks also to the, the, the capacity, organizational capacity and infrastructure to be able to manage that, negotiate that. Uh, some of the human capital issues that I think Laura talked about in her presentation, uh, perhaps a good example of where senior governments can play a mediating convening role and making sure that that happens well. So it's not simply private benefit and public cost. Thank you. Um, Patrick would like to ask, um, could you elaborate on the importance of strong local and regional governments in maintaining and expanding local services? I think certainly it's a great question. And, and, you know, as we talked about that sort of 30 year worth draw of, of some more senior governments, we've had local governments either by virtue of uh, absolute necessity or really seeing some of the benefit of their involvement of having to move into some of that space that was traditionally occupied by senior governments. Um, at, and, and the, you know, the, 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 what we've been learning about regional development over the last sort of 10 or 15 years is, you know, about understanding how to scale that activity up. Uh, that often rural small town cases, local governments are too small to deal with some of these issues on their own. Uh, and if they can become better coordinated, partnered uh, with surrounding communities in a region, it not only raises the capacity they have to deal with some of these issues, the funds to deal with some of the issues, but also their, you know, I guess more effective lobbying uh, in terms of going to senior levels of government and say, look, we're organized, we're working together. Uh, can be part of the solution. So a critical part, both in terms of uh, resourcing and, and you know, providing capacity for service delivery and infrastructure renewal, uh, but also just getting organized in terms of working with senior levels of government and industry. And that, yes. uh, well, you know, I think one of the challenges that came up in our research is that we had um, some local governments that were being very proactive. They realized the role that rural services uh, that provided by nonprofits was playing in order to attract and retain uh, larger economic development opportunities as well. So that's why um, so many of them decided that, uh, you know, they realized that there was inadequate social infrastructure in their communities to support the work that those groups were doing. And so they stepped up to be able to uh, lead uh, the consultation and development processes uh, uh, between the local governments and the nonprofits to develop some of these initiatives uh, and in order to look forward to um, enhancing the resiliency of their communities. So it's recognizing the connection between the social development and the economic development that's really critical. All right, thank you. Um, a question from Mark Edwards. Um, for, so for anyone wishing to comment, I can see where health and education would be topics where there is substantial agreement among people of different political orientations 
where all want a local hospital or quality schools, how might other topics achieve or fail to get people to collaborate locally as you have been discussing? Uh, for example, preserving versus um, exploiting natural resources or policying or serving low income people, affordable housing, food security and other elements of poverty. Um, these seem more con they seem more contentious and politically div uh, divisive. Yes, or at least in the US from where he has seen it. Um, perhaps I'll just, I'll draw a little bit from the Kitimat example again, uh, because I think uh, there was a bit of a sense early on that homelessness was not a problem or that uh, poverty was not a problem in the community. Uh, but quickly, because there was, uh, you know, the work camps weren't put in place right away. And so uh, there was a lot of housing pressures uh, that would be experienced by long-term residents, as well as even people who are working in banks uh, and working at the hospitals there. Uh, and so that's why they had to really invest in research and information, uh, because that way everyone's speaking facts against facts. And so once they had, once they had that housing assessment completed, they could realize just how much housing, uh, you know, how vacancy rates were changing, how much they could, they could see the proof in front of them about how it was affecting rental costs. And then you started to see the slow changing of conversation, um, not just amongst local government or nonprofits, but also with industry, because they started to realize the role that the living out allowances were having on local housing pressures. Uh, and in fact, in some cases, industries would be bidding against some of their uh, contractors, uh, you know, for the same things. The costs were just being passed over, right? So, uh, you know, and then as well, you know, small businesses were starting to see it impact their bottom line in terms of recruiting and retaining uh, staff uh, in order to keep their businesses open. Um, so, you know, they started to see how everything was a lot more interconnected. Uh, and as a result, uh, they started getting a lot more engagement uh, in their housing committee, uh, and they've got a pretty good um, housing strategy in place now as well that's moving forward. Alrighty, thank you, Laura. Neil, do you have something to add? Oh, just, I was just going to add that uh, in addition to all of that, um, uh, 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 you know, having a shared vision, like uh, getting agreement uh, on, a, on an end goal um, is absolutely critical to, to keeping people uh, at the table and keeping uh, the foot on the, on the gas, as it were. So, you know, even the examples I gave in the healthcare examples, it might seem on the surface that everybody, everybody wants better healthcare, but there's um, all kinds of uh, different models out there and different opinions about how to achieve that. So to get all the people together um, uh, to work on this, um, these initiatives um, required a great deal of uh, thought and effort uh, to to develop and to communicate a, a shared vision. So I think that's probably also very important. Alrighty, thank you. Um, I do have one question from one of the participants who unfortunately couldn't make it to this webinar. So she did email me her question in advance uh, for this webinar. So her name is Tracy Robertson. Um, she is a supervisor of the Ethnocultural Program at the Society of Manitobans with Disabilities. Um, they are a cultural brokerage program working with newcomers and refugees with disabilities in Winnipeg. Um, they know that there are many more refugees and newcomers settling in rural Manitoba than in the past and, and they are frequently asked about the possibilities of providing services to newcomers and refugees with disabilities in rural uh, communities. Um, their work, um, the work of their program involves nine members of staff um, who between them speak 21 different languages. They work very closely with their clients helping them to navigate the complex and support system available to them. So because of their work in, uh, because their work is in the city of Winnipeg, um, over a fairly small geographic area, they are able to maintain that one-on-one -on -one contact, uh, which allows them to build a strong and trusting relationship with their clients. Um, they have been looking at different models that would assist them in reaching out to refugees and newcomers in rural communities um, that would be eligible for their program. However, the distance and remote factors are a stumbling blocks. Um, they would like to know, have you come across um, types of uh, 
healthcare programs or services that work with individuals and families over a large geographic area slash remote area? Um, if so, can you share examples of some of the strategies and tools that used to maintain contact and build relationships with their clients? I, no, I don't really have anything specific to that kind of question, but perhaps in, in parallel, um, we are seeing um, parts of, of rural New Zealand are becoming much more diverse, particularly with the shift to dairy farming and the reliance on migrant workers who are here on temporary work visas to do the, to do the manual labor. And um, what we're finding is that's really transforming um, some, a lot of these rural communities. And the particular institution that's bringing people together is, are the churches. The churches are being reinvigorated. Um, and so the, the churches end up playing the, mag, the magnet or the coalescing role of bringing people together because these are um, off migrant workers that may be in one, one town one year and then they go back to their home country and then back in a different town the following year. But it is the church that provides that uh, constant connection when they're in New Zealand. Perfect. Um, I might just add, uh, certainly in, in rural British Columbia, we have uh, one organization called the Robson Valley Support Services Society, um, and they provide outreach supports to unincorporated rural areas um, around uh, McBride to Dunster and Belmont. And so they've actually got offices in both McBride and Belmont. Uh, and then they have outreach support workers that will go out to uh, everywhere from Dome Creek. I mean, it's, it's quite, a, quite a significant area. It takes a couple, at least a couple hours to drive from one end to the other uh, in order to reach and build those relationships with clients. Um, and uh, they definitely go way out of their way. Um, I should also point out, just because you were talking a little bit about refugees, um, in case anyone wasn't um, aware, last fall there was a standing Senate committee on looking at how provincial and federal governments were impacting nonprofit organizations. And there's certainly, when, when I was in Ottawa, there was a fair bit of discussion looking at immigrant and refugee services uh, as a part of that discussion. Uh, and they should be coming out with a report uh, soon, if not already. So I think it would be interesting to to, to go have a look on the Senate website to see, or just to track that. Another, another possible resource is uh, the Rural Policy Learning Commons Project, which is uh, sponsoring the webinar today, uh, has an immigrant um, immigration uh, themed network. Mm -hmm. And um, if you were able to contact the network leads uh, with that group, which you could find through our website, they might be able to uh, provide you with some more examples or resources uh, in terms of uh, making those types of connections. I think it connects really nicely to Bill Reimer's question earlier around the urban rural connections and how do you facilitate those uh, those communications and networking. All right, thank you. Uh, Bill, Bill Reimer has another question. Um, his question is, are you seeing any useful changes in the perspectives and trainings for those in the medical profession? Yeah, definitely. Um, uh, so uh, in British Columbia, we have the uh, distributed medical education program. So uh, the Faculty of Medicine at UBC has distributed campuses um, in Victoria, Kelowna, not too rural so far, but now there's, uh, but of course we also have Prince George with a um, cohort of I think 32 students a year uh, going through this program. Um, so after one semester together in Vancouver, uh, um, the, the different uh, distributed uh, groups, cohorts uh, move off to their campuses and um, the subsequent um, medical education includes all kinds of, um, uh, I suppose, uh, practical and um, practical experience and mentorship uh, in uh, rural and, or well, at least a smaller town sort of healthcare or medicine and, and delivery. So both a better understanding of what it's like to live in a smaller center, um, but also a more practical sense about um, what it's like to be a family physician uh, generalist uh, working in a, in a community of 20,000 or a community of 10,000 and uh, what it's like to handle those caseloads and to manage your career and to keep up with the latest in medical advances and so on. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really great example of uh, both at, uh, trying to uh, identify those uh, who, who might have um, 
sort of a proclivity to, to uh, practice outside of a metropolitan center, but also to give them um, a realistic sense of, of what they're in for. So um, that's a really great example of, uh, um, of, of medical education, um, um, a new model anyway. And part of that as well is working in teams, working in groups, uh, more interdisciplinary practice and so on, which I think is very, not only exciting, but also um, necessary for uh, future rural sustainability. Alrighty, thank you. I am just gonna ask one more last question because we are running a bit over time here. Um, so it is from Ray Bo Bowman. Um, so this is a question for everyone. Um, it seems that health services provision um, need a larger and larger population base in order to be viable and efficient. Also, it seems that many communities cannot grow their popu uh, population fast enough in order to have the required population to maintain a viable health service. What is the best way forward for the smaller communities? I think this builds on something that Neil said earlier. It's having a clear, clear vision of what kind of health services you want because you have to make tough decisions and you have to make uh, prioritize and make choices. Um, and that, that maybe you, you preserve and focus on aged care so that people can age in place or you may want to invest and preserve a single maternity bed in, in your community. Um, but that'll come down to uh, sort of resolving that and having a clear, clear sense of purpose and priority at a, at a community level. Um, but it is making hard choices uh, around uh, what services can be provided and uh, a clear understanding of what goes along with that in terms of uh, resources, funding, local commitment and, and capacity. I would agree and, and just reiterate uh, as well, the, the, the you know, strengthening primary care is your, your first focus. Um, and then from there, um, regionalized uh, connections to uh, more specialized services and using whatever technologies you can, but, but otherwise uh, various different models of, uh, um, uh, well, travel support, um, uh, visiting professional programs, um, um, but then just uh, making good linkages with um, the nearest available uh, larger centers with uh, the, the, the levels of service that are needed. Uh, and uh, having a good uh, vision for, for that, as, as Sean pointed out. Perfect. And I'll just uh, quickly add, you know, I think because we chatted with so many communities that range from, you know, like 400 to maybe up to 17,000 or so, um, but that's where the shared infrastructure really comes in. Because even though they might have small populations, if you can get a number of groups together that are there, then investing in energy efficient assets, and are able to find ways to retain ownership of those assets. Um, so we did have uh, one group, you know, that uh, well, we have we have a few groups that did manage to eventually get ownership over their assets. That's going to allow them to then allocate more resources uh, to program staff and those kinds of things. So whether it's through ownership or through shared infrastructure arrangements, um, that's going to go a long way. Alrighty, thank you everyone for answering all those questions. Um, do you guys have anything to add or any last minute comments? Just uh, just thanks to you, Ms. Aline, for uh, facilitating the session here today and helping get us organized. And, and again, thanks to all the participants for joining us today. It's been, a, it's been a enjoyable uh, getting a chance to share the work and to uh, have some of these important conversations. Okay. Um, so once again, I would like to thank Sean um, Connolly, Neil Henlon, Sean Murky, and Laura Reiser for your great presentation. Um, I would also like to thank the audience um, for attending this webinar and for their participation. Um, have a great day, everybody, and thank you for participating. Uh, thanks very much. Bye, everyone. Take care. Ciao. Bye now.